good afternoon, good morning, good evening. So thank you all that are joining us uh, today for another very interesting talk that will be done by Krishna Kumar Nair from Facebook USA, that he's been a machine learning architect and research scientist at Facebook. So prior to joining Facebook, he was working as an architect at Intel. So Krina has expertise in architecture development for deep learning accelerators and has worked on the development of a number of deep learning uh, accelerators. So uh, uh, he's going to talk, as you can see, about accelerators for deep learning, a uh, very, very interesting subject. So uh, thank you very much, Krishna Kumar, for accepting our invitation. And now the floor is with you to start your talk. Hey, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, Ricardo, for your kind words. Thanks a lot for the opportunity uh, for being able to present in this forum. Um, um, so, uh, uh, so I am Krishna. I currently work at Facebook, and um, I, like Ricardo mentioned, I worked on uh, many industry accelerators, uh, uh, both in inference and training, and on different form factors and at different scales. Um, so. Uh, uh, I, so since the audience here is a uh, kind of a set of people who are new to deep learning, I would assume, and some of the folks would already be very familiar with deep learning, I have uh, split the uh, uh, presentation roughly into two parts. The first part, I start off from very basics, almost give a first principle view of what deep learning is and how hardware acceleration and deep learning happens. The second part of the talk is um, is uh, more condensed and there are a very few foils and I'll be talking uh, uh, on these bullet points uh, a lot. So I would appreciate the second part of the presentation to be more a discussion. I would invite questions from all of you and I would try and answer as many questions as I can. Um, as you are all aware, uh, deep learning is a very uh, interesting area now. Uh, the last decade has been uh, really fantastic after the uh, after AlexNet came up, um, um, every it has almost touched every aspect of our lives, really. Um, and because of that, in the last few years, you would have suddenly seen a huge surge in the number of accelerators that are being done for deep learning. Um, so having said that, uh, let's move to the uh, actual material. As I mentioned, the first uh, set of foils are uh, uh, basic in nature. So folks who are aware of this, please be patient. Hopefully the next, uh, the, the later part of the presentation would be of more interest to you. So uh, as a start, right, assume that uh, the, the, uh, what I'm trying to do here is build an intuition of what deep learning really does at a very high level. Uh, so assume that you have to build a poor man's digit recognition system, right? And you, you want to come up with a system that differentiates between zero and one. So how would you go about doing that? So a simple way would be you draw a horizontal line uh, right across uh, the images and you cross, count what are called, called as zero crossings, right? And you uh, plot them in space, right? So for example, for the digit one, uh, you have two zero crossings and for the digit zero, you have four zero crossings and you plot this in space and you pick up a point uh, the point can mathematically uh, mathematically be represented by an equation of y is equal to wx, such that the point is between uh, 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 the first uh, the the two points, right? Now out here, uh, zero and one are called labels. Uh, two and four are input features, and y is equal to wx, which was the equation that we came up with, is the mathematical model. And at an at, essence of it, this is what deep uh, deep learning or any kind of machine learning does at a very high level. You are, you are taking, converting an input, you are extracting features from it, you are plotting them in space, and you are coming up with a mathematical model. Now, uh, this breaks, for example, if I bring in the digit 2, right? If I bring in the digit 2, and if I have a horizontal line between 0, 1, and 2, uh, right? I can differentiate 0 and 1, but I cannot differentiate between 1 and 2. So in order to be able to differentiate between 1 and 2, uh, what I could potentially do is I could potentially just draw a vertical line. Right? The moment I draw a vertical line, I actually get a differentiation between 
uh, one and two, right? Because uh, uh, one would have two points versus two would have six six there, right? So essentially, this is what uh, at a high level machine learning is about, right? You have two distinct phases in machine learning. The first phase is called a training phase. A training phase is essentially uh, provide a large amount of inputs. Uh, you uh, you have data set. The data set uh, each of the inputs in that data set has a label associated with it. So, for example, uh, at a high level, assume images, right? You would have a lot of input images, and you would have input labels for those images that are pre-recorded. For example, a cat, a dog, a ship. Uh, an automobile, something like that. Uh, from that input, you would extract features and you would run a cost optimization algorithm such that you can draw a separation between all these various points in space. And that separation of all those various points in space gives you essentially a mathematical model, right? Uh, training process is highly iterative and heavily compute intensive and uh, time consuming, right? Once you have this mathematical model, uh, every time you get a new input, you would feed that through the mathematical model and you could predict the label. So for example, uh, you give a new image now and you don't know what that image is, but the model predicts that it is a cat. So at a high level, this is this is how machine learning works. Um, it's it's a, a 10,000 feet high level view, but uh, kind of reasonably accurate. Uh, so again, just to build intuition, we'll go over another example. So assume that you have uh, uh, two coins that you want to differentiate, uh, right? So you take a huge set of these two coins. And since these coins are not tangible for a for an algorithm or a machine, you would extract something which is tangible and machine readable or can be used by machines. So you would convert that into numerical values, for example, such as diameter or weight, right? This process of conversion is feature extraction. Then you would run the process of SGD, like I mentioned. SGD is effectively just trying to place a line like I'm showing, and this line iteratively keeps moving around till it finds the right spot. And this becomes the model. The line is the model. And every time you have a new point, for example, you got a star, right? Now you know that that star is above the line. And so you know that it's probably the yellow sort of coin versus the blue sort of coin. Um, so typically, right, the way a machine learning, like when we went back to uh, this, this example, the equation of a line is essentially y is equal to uh, m1, it's, uh, y1 is equal to w11 x1 plus w21 x1 plus b1, right? That's the equation of a line. And you might want to get multiple classifications out of it, right? You might want to get uh, uh, a cat and a dog using the same machine learning model. Hence, you might have two points in this model. And effectively, I can represent both those equations in a simple uh, uh, representation like this. And if you look at this representation, this is very sim similar to the representation of an artificial neuron, right? So effectively, you have a bunch of weights with a bunch of features that come in, you multiply them, and you add all of them, which effectively gives you what is a dot product. And uh, you have an activation function from there on. So we'll, we'll talk about the activation function later. But effectively, uh, a neuron in a machine, a neuron is effectively just drawing a straight line. Uh, that's all that a neuron is really doing. And that straight line, the parameters of that neuron are effectively learned by that STD so that that's straight line causes a differentiation in uh, a separation in space. Now, um, what typically happens is sometimes you are not able to get a separation in space, like I mentioned with the digit recognition. So you would add another feature, 
and that feature now which was just diameter and weight you add something called as luminosity for example and now it becomes from a two dimensional uh, problem to a three dimensional problem but in reality machine learning and and that line that you had becomes from a simple line to a plane a 3d plane right but in reality uh, machine learning problems have huge amount of dimensions right it might uh, you could keep adding dim dimensions because it keeps getting separate you you want to create a separation in space sometimes you need to keep adding the dimensions without which you cannot have separation with uh, in space so it's difficult to visualize number one but at a very high level for an intuition um, you can think of this problem as a problem of treating vectors rather than treating scalars and from a hardware perspective or from a hardware acceleration perspective the problem essentially becomes a vector processing problem versus a scalar processing problem and this intuition goes a long way in understanding why accelerators how and why accelerators are required in uh, in the space of deep learning right so for example um i gave an example of a straight line but there there are other models for example k means clustering is another deep machine learning model uh, within which you actually cluster the problem right and when you are clustering the problem uh, you probably need to find the distance right you, you you created a cluster and now you represent the cluster as some sort of uh, sphere sphere right in multiple dimension now when you are representing this as a point in a multiple dimension you want to find out when you get a new point where that new point lies right so you want to find out distance from the center of the sphere and if you had a hardware accelerator that actually could give you distance in any form right it could be manhattan or it could be euclidean but any form that does a distance then that would be very useful now this distance metric because it's an n dimensional sphere or uh, for uh, for a lack of a better term right it's uh, it becomes a vector processing problem and hence a hardware that can work on vectors versus on scalars can do much better at this problem um so we spoke about simple separation curves right we spoke about k means clustering which effectively draws a circle of some sort or a sphere of some sort a gaussian mixture model also work, is an extension of uh, of a of of a sphere right in, in some form uh, it's a distance algorithm right but it sometimes you are not able to get a separation in space for example in this particular case you are not able to get a separation in space if you draw a straight line it it just won't work right so the intuition here is how would you solve this problem so one neuron gives you a straight line if you could put in multiple neurons then you potentially could create more complex curves out of that straight line right and that's where the intuition for hidden layers come in right it makes the neural network more efficient in finding separations and finding these curves and that's the intuition behind uh, hidden layers right and so uh, it, when you add a hidden layer um, if you do the math around it for example i have kind of worked the math out here you would see that uh, uh, i i i uh, wrote down these two equations right uh, which effectively show the equations of the of the two lines h1 and h2 right but when you combine them to form y the final y output you see that it creates a series of constants h1 w11 h2 w12 for example which can be represented as m1 and h1 w21 h2 w22 which could be represented as m2 right and since both of them are constants even though you added that intermediate layer you really still got the equation of a straight line and it did not really benefit uh, the fact that you added uh, an intermediate layer here right because the intermediate layer eventually the whole model could still be represented as a single neuron and hence a single straight line 
right and this is where the intuition for the non linearity layer comes in so uh, non linearity layers i love you uh, for uh, uh, for creating these complex curves it allows each of those lines to be distinct and each of those lines to move in space and uh, these non linearity uh, layers come in different forms there's a lot of paper and research on what non linearities are effective and which are not the most common ones used are sigmoid tanh relu there are things like switch leaky, uh, leaky relu that are coming up but uh, but effectively uh, uh, these non linearities need to be also implemented in hardware because they are a very integral part of uh, uh, the math that surrounds these neural network accelerators so when you have operators you typically would have fully connected layers or a convolution layer uh, in a neural net followed by uh, these non linearities uh, right lstms uh, also have these non linearities right for for them to make it effective so these non linearities are very important and uh, they are not uh, easy for hardware acceleration from that perspective because it, 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 it there is a huge amount of patterns that are possible here and uh, so those are things that need to be handled in hardware as well so going back to our case of a single neuron right so i mentioned that a single neuron is nothing but a vector vector dot product so you have a bunch of inputs right and you have a bunch of uh uh weights and you multi multiply them element wise and then you add all of them there's obviously a bias equation here and i have ignored that just for simplicity um, but effectively you can represent the this operation as a dot product operation now in hardware what you would effectively and, and again there are various ways of implementation this and i might be trivializing this to some extent but it allows you to give you an intuition of what's happening uh, so in hardware what you would typically do is you would have element wise multiplies and then you have an adder tree and effectively you implement this dot product right um Uh, and uh, uh, again there is a lot of uh, implementation challenges depending upon how you are doing this depending upon how wide your reduction width in this particular equation k is right whether this is uh, fixed point arithmetic or integer math or floating point arithmetic right because uh, floating point arithmetic is obviously expensive and so you could do optimizations to actually make this more efficient uh, uh, but this is the essence of what a neuron how a neuron would be implemented in in hardware but like we mentioned in the first example right you might have a cat a dog or multiple such classes that you need to find out categorize and come up with so you are really not dealing with one neuron you are dealing with multiple neurons and these inputs typically go to those multiple neurons and from that perspective what we just spoke about a dot product can be replicated right so you typically have a vector matrix multiply right this is the intuition behind that right so when you have a vector matrix multiply this gives you more efficiency into the problem because you once you get an input you have at least some amount of reuse with the weights that you have and you are generating multiple outputs out of it so this simple accelerator that we showed which was essentially a dot product followed by an adder tree could now be represented as something different so it could now be uh, represented as multiple of these vector multiply adder trees but they are all instantiated uh right and you get one uh input and you broadcast that across these multiple weights and hence you could generate multiple of these outputs at the same time right so as you can see there is an increased reuse that we are able to get in hardware because of such an operation but you want to take this to the next level um uh, 
So for example, rather than processing just one input image, typically you would want to process multiple such input images. Uh, uh, the uh, gradient descent algorithm typically in training is batched and that's how you get more efficiency. Even on the inference side, right? You might be able to think of things like saying, hey, you know what, if I'm sending, if I'm having speech recognition done in a cloud, I could do the feature extraction on the phone and then send it to the cloud and then multiple people could be, uh, uh, you could be uh, uh, doing uh, multiple samples together at the same time and doing speech recognition on the cloud, right? So all of this gives you more data to play with. So the operation that we just defined earlier, which was effectively a vector matrix multiply Right. So rather than having one input, which is X1, X2, the feature of X1 to X2 N, right, becomes a feature of XB1 to XBN, which is effectively you added a batch dimension to the problem. So rather than a, a vector matrix multiply, you effectively got a matrix matrix multiply. And this suddenly increase the amount of reuse you had in the problem much more and hence you got more re more efficiency out of the problem right so uh, think of the fact that you could bring in weights and then you are processing these weights multiple times and you are suddenly getting much more reuse in the problem so even in the hard from a hardware perspective effectively this is what you do right you bring in a set of weights like like we discussed right we effectively had that simple element wise uh, uh, multiply followed by an adder tree. You instantiated that multiple times. And then rather than just doing the broadcast with one input, you now did a broadcast with multiple inputs. And this gives you a very simple matrix, matrix multiply hardware, right? And uh, now we also see from first principles how this is useful for machine learning and deep learning in, in particular, right? Because it's, it, effect, it effectively solves matrix multiplies, right? By using reuse to the problem. And this is at the heart of any deep learning accelerator. Any deep learning accelerator would have a very good matrix uh, multiply logic, right? And this matrix multiply could be done through multiple ways. Uh, some places you would see them adding it as an extension to the CPU, as a new instruction to the CPU. Or you could do this as a processor coprocessor sort of a model. You have a processor that does general purpose stuff. You could add a coprocessor. Or in some places where you, your programmability requirements are not very important, this becomes the main component, right? And, the, and everything else plays around this matrix matrix multiply logic. Uh, one important thing to note here is the dimension of this uh, matrix matrix multiply block uh, is very important. Um, so, so what do I mean by that? So typically, not only do you put in one such block, you instantiate multiple uh, such matrix matrix multiply blocks. So you create some sort of a grid or some sort of an internal fabric in our in your SOC or accelerator when you are uh, doing this. Uh, now, you have multiple dimensions here. The first dimension is the reduction dimension, typically called K, right? And then you have a dimension, uh, which, is this, uh, which is the number of uh, weight vectors that you are looking at. And then you have a dimension, which is the number of activations that you are broadcasting. Each of these dimensions depend upon the size of the problem or that you are tackling or uh, the accelerator that you are targeting for and every use case every company might have a different accelerator uh, different uh, pro uh, problem space and hence different sizes where these problems could be right sized to uh, right so we spoke about matrix multiply but in uh, this is one of the first like from Jan Lacun's uh, paper, right? Uh, um, this is one, this is a, a typical neural network, right? You, it just doesn't have fully connected or uh, 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 fully connected layers or matrix multiply operations, right? It has other operations too, right? It has uh, convolutions, 
it has pooling operations which are effectively subsampling uh, it has like i mentioned non linearities it has other operations too uh, but the interesting part here is that convolutions have a lot of compute intensity and so do matrix multiplies um, um, uh, com com convolutions in such a problem uh, not only do you convolution in itself has a heavy, heavy amount of reuse because you move your filter across but you have a channel dimension where you do reductions right so it effectively becomes like a 3d sort of a block that you are moving around uh, but you also have multiple such filters so all of that give you tremendous amount of reuse and because of that you get a lot of compute intensity in the problem and any problem that has a lot of compute intensity becomes more compute bound than memory bound and lends itself heavily to acceleration right so you could do things about it because once you move that data to a local memory you could go and accelerate it right but uh, you simply cannot just accelerate the compute intensive parts there are other operations like i mentioned that lie in between for example operations like pooling or subsampling operations like relu uh, uh, depending upon the problem that you are doing you might want to quantize it you might have other operators that sit in between you might have other types of neural networks that sit in between right so typically your hardware accelerator needs to handle not just this convolution and fully connected layers or matrix multiplies but also these other layers the interesting aspect also is that convolutions are very easily mapped to matrix multiplies uh, because convolutions can be mapped to matrix multiplies you typically have uh, your matrix multiply block if you do a very efficient matrix multiply implementation it helps you in general with your any type of convolution neural nets, uh, not just uh, other types of neural nets. Uh, but convolutions also come in all forms and factors, right? For example, uh, there is an operation uh, called depth-wise uh, uh, convolutions, uh, also group-wise convolutions to some extent, which do not have the same amount of compute intensity in the problem. Uh, uh, and because they don't have the same amount of compute intensity in the problem, you could convert it to matrix multiply, uh, but you wouldn't have the same amount of compute intensity, uh, right? Uh, so you wouldn't have the same amount of utilization and hence your efficiency would go down. So typically you try to do things with this, you try and probably look at more spatial ways of doing this or more fixed function ways of doing this. Uh, to map them so that you start extracting more efficiency out of uh, these blocks. Uh, so um, what I spoke till now uh, was more of the basics or most of the grounds of intuition build up. Uh, the next few files are going to be more of a detailed deep type you would see that uh, the, the content in the presentation is highly condensed, right? And I would appreciate this more to be a conversation and you to ask some questions when we go to the question and answer part of the session. Um, so uh, accelerators are typically different, right? The problem space in itself, even though you speak of deep learning, deep learning has a lot of things around it. Number one, there are different types of models, right? Uh, there are uh, recommendation systems, there are language models, there are uh, convolution nets, which work very well for images, uh, uh, right? So all of these have different flavors, but even something more, even before that is training versus inference, right? Training and inference look very, very different. Training has much larger batch size uh, than inference does. Uh, training has what is called as a back propagation phase. This back propagation phase has a lot of uh, attributes uh, or, or a lot of operators which don't exist in the inference phase. Uh, so if you are doing a training accelerator, you need to go and think about how you are going to implement those operators in the inference phase. You might be able to get away with not implementing those operators. And if you don't implement it, 
you potentially save on area because you don't implement it and also potentially on power because you don't have that piece of logic right depending upon how you do it right um, also on development time which is very very important um training has much more of compute requirement than inference um uh, so in training you're not looking at just the component itself when i say a component you're making one asic but you really thinking about a system that you built together uh, to do training so for example you you since you are trying to build a cluster of these uh, uh, things together you you need to worry about how they are going to communicate with each other so the interconnect topology becomes very very important right not just the fabric within your accelerator but the fabric across your accelerator becomes important not only that typically you have a host interface uh, right you your accelerators typically are pcie cards you connect them to your host you are connecting all of these pieces together and then you are making all of them talk so this so when you are doing a training system you cannot just look at optimizing your accelerator you are optimizing your system you are optimizing your system not just in hardware but also in terms of the software stack right because each of these have a different software component to it um uh, if you look at for example nvidia has nv link right and rdma for the network topology uh, right google has its own custom interconnect uh, on the tpu um the other aspect of training versus inferences uh, training has much larger uh, memory bandwidth requirement as well as much larger capacity requirements uh simply uh, for example um, when you are doing training you need to store all the intermediate values in the forward prop because you want to reuse them in your back prop right so all of them have to be stored so suddenly your training requirement goes up plus your batch sizes are relatively larger so your intermediate values go up too and since you are doing uh all of this since simply because training has such more higher a compute requirements you cannot fulfill that compute requirement without effectively feeding that compute so your bandwidth requirement goes up inference becomes a slightly different problem right inference might be targeted towards a very real time requirement right you want to do a speech recognition problem and your real time requirements become more important so from an inference perspective latency could be a very high target right and the other thing is your batch size on inference might be really low because your latency bound so you have to optimize your matrix multiply block differently the other interesting thing between training and inference is training typically has a larger dynamic range requirement depending upon where you are targeting things towards right inference uh, depending on where you are targeting things towards might not have the same amount of dynamic range requirement so you typically might have different numerics all together that are used on training versus what are used on inference um so uh this is just on training versus inference but you might for example have uh, uh other place here too you might have for example edge versus a data center right um uh, edge is closer edge might really have so uh, edge might really have uh, more stringent power requirements um uh, because you might not be connected to a power supply you might be just running from a battery uh even though i said that data center also does have power requirements right because because effectively you have a power budget but uh, as you can see it, it's clearly uh, a different ball game um going back to training versus inference right so isic development is a really uh, intensive effort uh, it takes a lot of manpower it takes a lot of planning and from that perspective uh, there is always this whole thought process saying hey you know what how should we do this should we have a single chip should we have a single solution should we do multiple solutions and all of these are interesting conversations uh, that that we have in terms of uh, the attributes that are required in an accelerator uh, so some of the important uh, attributes uh, probably the most important attributes is uh, the efficiency in terms of power right so tops is effectively the tera operations per second per watt uh, 
right? Um, and that's a metric that is highly tracked. If you look at a data sheet of most accelerators, that's the number that people will go and look at the first, right? And that comes typically from more system level requirements on um, where your accelerator is being deployed. Uh, deployed. So like I mentioned, right, the, the lesser you can keep your what, effectively the more tops you can get because your budget is the same, right? Uh, so uh, you, you, you for even for the data center space, you want to make sure your uh, efficiency is very, very high. Your power efficiency is very, very high. So that's where this whole conversation that I mentioned about utilization of the matrix multiply block, about the efficiency of the matrix multiply block comes in. So like I mentioned, there are multiple dimensions here. There is the dimension in the matrix multiply block as well. But there are multiple such matrix multiply blocks that are instantiated. Um, so because of this, you might have a distribution problem, right? And each of these op layers look differently, right? So for example, one convolution layer might look very different to the next convolution layer in terms of the way that convolution is laid out. And when you map that convolution to a matrix multiply block, you might need to take different decisions at each layer. So you typically would need a uh, good um, sort of a compiler to be able to do things like these. Uh, the other things uh, that are, for example, uh, very important is uh, efficiency versus raw tops, right? Um, so it's not just important to actually just put the matrix multiply out there. It's important to use them efficiently. And how do you partition it such that you use them, you use them effectively, uh, right? Um, so that's an important problem. Tops per what directly relies on reuse, right? Um, from computer architecture 101, right? Reuse gives you more power efficiency because the closer uh, the things are, the more efficient memories you could use. Right. And uh, typically in any accelerator design, you, you use the same tricks, right? You use them differently, right? The reason you use them differently is because uh, uh, the reuse pattern is completely known. You are completely aware of how your for loops are going to function. And because you are aware of how the for loop is going to function, you could do those things by use managing them through software rather than or firmware rather than having a hardware managed cache that is traditionally used. Also, like I mentioned, there are a lot of things which are not uh, traditionally. Uh, uh, so there are a lot of things that are used which are not traditionally uh, um, um, uh, uh, mapped to uh, matrix multiply block, right? For example, you might have things like nonlinearity. You might want to convert your uh, floating point numbers to fixed point number representation and then uh, convert them back into some other uh, floating point representation intermediate or some other uh, range conversions that are required. So all of this gives you enormous opportunity of fusing, right? Because you have like a math logic followed by nonlinearity, followed by quantization. So these, these things are coupled and in some sort of a data flow. So you could potentially have fixed function logic that couples all of these right, uh, and implements them. The interesting thing is all of, if you look at the matrix multiply block, the matrix multiply block generates multiple outputs at the same time, right? So it's very clear that you need something which is sort of a vector hardware or a SIMD hardware beyond that to operate on that. So that's where you, you, you use them, right? The other operation that is used very heavily, for example, in recommendation systems is something called as an embedding lookup, right? And they are heavily SIMD too, and they are a very different type of operation. They are very memory bound, and you, you want to have support for even that sort of operation in your accelerator, right? So when we speak of tops, it's not just roughly uh, tops that you get from matrix multiply, but your SIMD tops matter too if you are, for example, running recommendation systems. Uh, we spoke about capacity and the need for higher capacity, higher bandwidth on training versus inference, right? And that leads to a design choice of HBM versus DDR, right? HBMs give you much higher uh, 
bandwidth, but come at the cost of higher power, substantially higher power, and uh, at lower capacity than DDR, uh, right? As well as integration challenges. Uh, so uh, these are uh, interesting trade-offs that you need to take into account when you are designing an accelerator. Um, like I mentioned, memory bandwidth is uh, super critical. You suddenly have uh, higher tops, right? And you need to be able to feed these tops. With every generation, there's a requirement for pushing in more tops into the system. So you have a requirement for putting in more compute into the system. So you cannot put in that compute unless you put in more bandwidth, right? And so that's an interesting space and how that space is evolving. The other aspect is uh, the connection to your host, right? Like I mentioned in training, you're typically working on a PCIe card um, and you you put a, your PCIe card and you're building a system out of it. You're connecting these, uh, this host PCIe accelerator multiple times, uh, even multiple PCIe accelerators per host and then connecting them multiple times. It is super important on how programmable your accelerator is, right? Because every time you go back and forth to the host, assume that you have an operator that you cannot support in the accelerator. So every time you go back and forth, you you take a cost, right? Because you take the cost of the penalty of going, transferring data over your PCIe link. And uh, effectively, that's a power cost, that's a latency cost. Right, um, and then you got to do that operation there. Right, you, you could pipeline things, but these are all costs, and you need to worry about that. Uh, you are building a system in training, and not uh, necessarily just the component. So the fabric that you choose, the fabric topology that you choose, how you connect the fabric becomes very important. Uh, in fact, it's it's. So important that since you are connecting the system, if you if you get that configuration wrong, for example, if you become uh, interconnect bound, right? And even if you have high compute and high bandwidth, but if you become interconnect bound, you are effectively becoming slowed down by that interconnect itself. And in something like, for example, training where you are doing stochastic S uh, uh, SGD, right? Uh, sorry, synchronous SGD, uh, you simply could increase the duration that. Uh, of the time that you require for training, or you like uh, if you are doing asynchronous, you you simply might not converge, right? Because you you uh, you don't get the correct gradients. Um, other important factor here is uh, the numerics uh, associated, like I mentioned, right? When you are doing inference, you really want to have a low footprint. Um, Reducing the numerics, for example, if you go from, for example, a 16-bit numeric to an 8-bit numeric, you clearly get more like uh, 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 um, a higher compute, but you also get more bandwidth out of it, right? Because you have to fetch less data from your memory, right? There are trade-offs here. For example, when you are doing quantization from floating point to fixed point arithmetic, you use symmetric or you could use asymmetric quantization. And when you are using symmetric or versus asymmetric quantization, uh, you, you require fixed function operations. And sometimes you might need to support both, or sometimes you might need to support different types of quantization set strategy, depending upon how, uh, how you are working on it. A really interesting aspect is uh, Vflow 16 that came from Google. It's, it's now deployed very, very highly, right? It, it's been proven to work. And uh, like it, uh, it's 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 a numeric format that came in for deep learning and has stuck. So going back to uh, to the need for ASICs, right? Um, as we can clearly see, right? Um, there is matrix multiply uh, that works. There are operations uh, that can be mapped to matrix multiply, for for example, convolutions, right? Uh, that have both matrix multiply and convolutions have high amount of reuse. Matrix multiply, for example, could be done using outer product formulations that really give you good reuse, depending upon your batch size. Uh, uh, convolutions have a high amount of reuse, so makes sense to accelerate them. Uh, there are operations that lie in between all of these, 
right? Which if you don't do some sort of a fixed function trick, or at least have some instruction extensions, uh, would suffer greatly if you don't have uh, good mechanisms to do this, right? Uh, your memory hierarchy has to be done for reuse, and it has to be done different from traditional CPUs, which generally use hardware managed caches. Uh, your software design has to take into account how your loop structure looks. Your compilers have to take into that account. And software design and compiler design become a huge part of your accelerator development program. Uh, you have to worry about your network. Um, the type of network you deploy depends upon the type of um, uh, model that you have, uh, to be very honest. right? You, it's not. Uh, it's not one pattern that would always fit for everything. Depending upon whether you are doing inference or training, you might have different, or if you are deploying it on uh, an edge, you might have different memory capacity, different bandwidth requirements, and different latency requirements. Numerics are extremely important, and you might need to have custom numerics in your hardware, and hence need support for that in your accelerator. And the fabric that you deploy locally on the accelerator actually has to manage all of these, uh, actually has to manage the distribution. And um, it's not spoken of very often, but it's a very important aspect of any accelerator design that you need to do. One thing uh, that, that is like I kept saying through this is the programmability. We are doing fixed function here. And the cost of all this is the programmability. So any development that you do here has to be programmable, more so in training than on inference. Um, and the programmability that uh, uh, you get is, so you, you need performance out of it. And so from, from grounds up, you need to worry about what your compiler strategy is going to be, what your distribution strategy is going to be. And uh, there is a heavy emphasis on the software tool chain. So the accelerator development is not just more a uh, hardware development problem, but also a software development challenge. So I have left uh, close to 15 minutes for any questions that you guys might have. So we have uh, several questions here, Chris. So, uh, so let's uh, read to you the first one. Uh, just a moment. So I have one question by uh, Ian Ray. How does systolic array fare as vector matrix multiplication hardware accelerator? So he is uh, from ST Micro in New Delhi. Sure. Uh, so systolic arrays have been uh, used very efficiently. Uh, we know, for example, if you read the TPU paper, systolic arrays have been used, and they are one implementation for the matrix multiply block. Uh, there are other implementations too that people have used. Uh, effectively, what you are doing is kind of the same thing I mentioned about unicasting and broadcasting. and all of this also matters like any good ASIC development problem is all, not just about uh, just putting the micro architecture there and implementing the RTL, but taking it all the way into silicon. Uh, so the strategy that you choose for the final matrix multiply implementation depends upon your problem space, the size of the matrix multiply block that you need based on your uh, uh, based on your uh, uh, based on your uh, algorithm or your particular size of matrix multiplies that you need from your algorithm, right? Um, yeah. Thank you. So another question is for from Michael Ferraz from the Federal Institute of uh, at Santa Catarina, Brazil. So the question is uh, why convolutions don't make use of uh, FFT? It's not more efficient. So yes, uh, so there were uh, there were uh, so for example, if you look at this uh, Vinograd, which is effectively a feature, which is effectively a transformation. Um, FF, uh, Vinograd has been used and shown to be used for uh, 
increasing the efficiency and doing convolutions using uh, vinograd but there are obviously trade offs depending upon the size of the problem the size of the uh, filter that you have right there is an efficiency trade off there but there are accelerators which have deployed vinograd to be able to uh, do this thank you so another question by Mishuir Nickel from Bruce Beck in Massachusetts. So are accelerators neutral to the application, uh, like uh, vision versus language understanding versus something? So there are a lot of commonalities like I, like I discussed, right? So for example, we uh, like, uh, like everyone uses NVIDIA today, right? And NVIDIA has been used both for training and inference, right? And there are commonalities. But depending upon the problem space, uh, there are optimizations that you could do uh, that allow you to uh, get more tops per watt depending upon your particular application, right? So you could always des design an, a, a more general purpose deep learning accelerator, uh, but you could also go ahead and uh, reorient this for your particular space. But again, right, having said all this, uh, remember that deep learning has been a very fast evolving space, right? You you, you need some time to develop ASICs. ASIC development takes time. And uh, typically by the time you go and do this whole fixed function thing in hardware, there's a risk that you take that the algorithm might change, right? Or there might be a new operator that comes in that gives you more efficiency. So it's, it's, it's a bunch of trade-offs. It's still, I think, an evolving space. And um, uh, so, so both options have been taken in, in my experience. I've seen people doing both. Thank you. So a question by Leandro Rocha from the Federal Institute of Regrette do Sul. So the question is, given that memory access has an energy cost orders higher than uh, max, what's the best approach to tackle this issue? The IM uh, multi-level memory and so on. So, uh, so uh, memory access is clear. So, like I mentioned, reuse is the best best way to handle that issue, right? Wherever you have an opportunity. So, reuse comes in different uh, fashions, right? One is you create a memory hierarchy, but some of these algorithms also provide reuse in other ways. So, for example, if you look at interconnection, like there are bypass layers in. Uh, in, in, for example, if you look at Google Inception, uh, there is a bypass layer. It is now used in a lot of places. So the outputs from one layer go to another layer and need to be resident. Um, you you design uh, so you design the accelerator depending upon the size. Right, that's what you look at when you're looking at the algorithm right up front. You you are worried about the sizes of of your matrices, your size of your intermediate values, uh, and how you are going to store them. Reuse is a is a is a very useful trick. Uh, uh, PIM PIM has been looked at. A lot of people are now proposing PIM based mechanisms to be able to do it such that you could for things where you are going to the memory and there is not too much reuse, you could do it close to the uh, close to or within the memory itself. For example, I mentioned embedding lookups. There's a lot of uh, material papers that have come up on accelerating embedding lookups and trying to do that in the memory itself. Uh, but that's that's the challenge. I think uh, the challenge is uh, reuse you know, and trying and ensuring uh, that uh, as you move forward, uh, um, how do you with with memory technology not scaling the same way that compute scales? How do you make sure you still keep the overall system very efficient? And this just not a problem for deep learning. I think this is a general problem for the industry. So another question by Ishio Nickel. What is the importance of post to accelerator latency bandwidth? What are the typical numbers? So I uh, so uh, depending upon you, you could look up the typical numbers based on the PCI generation that uh, you are using. Um, so uh, and latency becomes critical if you have a lot of back and forth. Also, just issuing the operator itself does have a latency cost. Um, ideally, what you would really want is once the operation is issued, that you stay resident within the accelerator and do the whole part within the accelerator, and then you give the uh, 
final result back uh, at least for inference that is what you typically do for training it depends right it, it is more complex uh, depending upon the operator support uh, how you would want to do it um, um, the programming model also becomes very important there as to how you do uh, the host to device communication uh, right it, uh, uh, software overheads there are non-trivial sometimes, and that is something that needs to be looked at. Thank you. So uh, another question by uh, I am Ray from West Micro. How is the network on ship for these accelerators different than traditional multi-core CPUs interconnect? Uh, uh, so again, there are a lot of patterns that are possible in this problem. So your network on chip could be designed to look at those patterns, right? Uh, uh, but uh, uh, effectively, the problem is the heavy bandwidth that you need, right? You need much higher bandwidth. You, you have a lot of these compute cores that could be arranged, and you have a lot of these bandwidth uh, that exist. So uh, a lot of bandwidth requirement that, that exists. So your knock needs to be. Uh, taken care of that bandwidth requirement as well as uh, on chip latency right on chip latency also becomes uh, very very important because you you assume that you have a lot of such clusters right i'm just giving an example out there uh, just because of the latency you, one of the clusters might just be so slow and lagging right that other clusters are not able like it's not able to meet up with the others right so it effectively would affect your tops because eventually you are waiting for one layer to complete before the next layer starts right i'm just throwing out a scenario here so not design is very important okay thank you so um, another question by hassan ibrahim what are your thoughts uh, so he's from uh, hassan in zurich what are your thoughts on uh, post number systems for AI accelerators. Uh, can you repeat that? What are your thoughts? Let, let me find the question again. Uh, what are your thoughts on post number system for AI accelerators? So I am I am sorry I'm not aware of that number uh, system. Um, so I, I probably am not in the position to comment. Okay. So another question by Ishu Nickel. Are accelerators usually PCIe linked? What about tighter integration to CPUs, like special instructions, vector units, and so on? So uh, everything is like uh, everything has been done, right? For example, if you have an edge device, uh, there is no integration, right? It, it sits on a standalone with a CPU sitting inside, right? There are CPU uh, extensions that have been uh, done, right? Uh, uh, which which are uh, in in vogue as well. Uh, uh, Intel has come up with something called a CXL, uh, which is essentially for accelerator design, and you could use CXL to connect accelerators to uh, CPU and have more tight integration, right? Uh, so there are all flavors of things there. Uh, the design choice that you take is for your particular problem and for your particular power envelope that you're targeting. So another one, again, by Ian Ray. A lot of research has been proposed, displayed for processing in memory with non-volatile memories like uh, RAM, PCM, and, and so on. What are your view on this? I think this is a good. Uh, I think uh, this this is bound. This was bound to happen because clearly for embedding uh, for embedding lookups, uh, that is the problem to solve. And um, uh, uh, I, I think eventually we uh, there will be solutions that uh, go towards that place, and the technology is going to help. Okay, thank you. So another question by Hassan Ibrahim from Hassan uh, Zurich. Uh, do you think the future of uh, AI accelerator 
leans towards application agnostic or application optimized accelerator? Sorry, can you repeat the last part of the question? Yeah. Um, do you think the future of AI accelerator leans towards application agnostic or application optimized accelerators? So I, I, I think it depends on your... Uh, so again, a lot of questions are coming because I've seen these multiple var varieties of things. So I, like that's, that's where I'm giving easy or gray answers. Uh, uh, but again, it depends on what you are trying to do, right? For example, if you have a training solution, right? And your training solution is going targeting a very wide range of applications, right? You need to have general purpose programmability. You need to be able to say, hey, you know, a new operator could come in and I need to be able to support that in hardware. So you need to be able to support a large variety of applications that come in, a large variety of operators that come in, a large variety of numerics potentially that could come in, right? Like. Uh, even though we don't see that now. Um, but if you are doing an inference, right, uh, and you are targeting an edge device, you are really bound on power. You are really bound on latency. You want to make the right architectural choices. You exactly know your application, and you just focus on that application and do it, right? And you try to target and meet that application. Um, it also depends upon how fast, like these are, these are non-technical things, right? But how how fast are you developing your accelerators, right? The time to market for your uh, uh, for your accelerator development uh, thing, right? If you're going to come up with accelerators every year, then that's the plan, then that's a different strategy that you employ. Versus if you are, you know, you say, you know what, this is a one-off thing and then we would try and do it again after some time, right? So there are different strategies that you employ depending upon the space that you see around you. Thank you. So a question now by Alessandro Veronese from uh, IHP Microelectronics in Frankfurt, Germany. Can you give some impressions on available open source uh, DLAs? So uh, I haven't uh, really looked at any open source uh, DLAs. I believe NVIDIA has open source something, but I really haven't looked at it or cannot comment on it. Okay. About the question about the post number system, Rishi or Nico here is saying that post number system by uh, John uh, Gustafsson, and uh, he's saying that post numbers uh, are an improved floating point compared to the IEEE floating point. Sure. Um, so uh, when you say improvement, how, where where does the improvement really happen, right? So typically, like what what Bflow did was essentially added more dynamic range and reduced on the precision, keeping things within sixteen bit. Um, is this some sort of logarithmic number representation system, which is not uh, floating point based? Uh, uh, the the important aspect of any of these. So there, there are there are two things whenever you play around with numerics, right? Uh, number one, does it converge for a wide range of applications, uh, right? And Bfloat 16 has been shown to do that for a wide range of applications. If it doesn't converge, uh, then then you are in trouble, right? There have been a lot of fixed point uh, based number representation systems that came up, and as the as the space evolved. The, the networks wouldn't converge, right? And you did, did the hardware and suddenly you realized, hey, the network is not converging. Um, the second aspect here is the implementation efficiency in hardware, right? Uh, you might, floating point is uh, is more expensive than fixed point arithmetic to implement in hardware, right? Uh, especially for things like lookup tables, clearly more and more expensive. Uh, if uh, whatever number representation system you choose has to also be power efficient because you're going an accelerator, right? So it might be able to uh, have a wide range of applications, right? But uh, we don't know. But having said this, there, there is a lot of uh, research happening on different numerical uh, number representation system and a lot of companies deploying it in accelerators. There are different floating point formats which are not Bfloat 16 or FP16 or FP32 using different Mantissa and uh, exponent combinations, right? So there's a huge setup out there. And those uh, folks 
it works for their application space and they just go ahead and deploy it and it, it works right so um there is it, it's still an evolving space i don't think there is a standard per se to say that any accelerator has to use uh, this number representation system uh, uh, people do support int8 mostly people do support bfloat 16 people do support int4 now uh, but uh, i don't think there is a really a, a huge commonality for saying hey, this is the number representation system that works for deep learning bfloat 16 has has come very close to that uh, but still for example on inference side people don't use bfloat 16 thank you so now a question by Thiago weber from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul at Colleg Brazil. Based on your experience on deep learning accelerators project, is there a trend to use mixed signal solutions for neural ne network processing or are they currently mostly digital? So I have seen um, a, a lot of companies uh, uh, pursuing analog startups, especially pursuing analog based solutions, right? Uh, to be honest, I haven't really followed that space or red papers based on that, but I do know that there are efforts in doing this. Okay, I have another last question from the audience. I am Ray from ST Microelectronics in New Delhi. From ASIC's implementation perspective, the accelerators have a lot of uh, max, which means high power to limit. Are we looking at only reducing the precision or some other methods? Um, precision. So, so in in um, in my mind, precision is an important knob. The other important knob is reuse, uh, right? Uh, then fixed function logic, right? Fusing multiple operators together in hardware is another knob that you use. Uh, uh, these are the your fabric design, right? All of this ties together somehow right like you, you your fabric design now tries to figure out how to reuse things more efficiently or how to make sure uh, you you do things right your memory hierarchy again uh, which is kind of coupled to reuse your host accelerator interaction right um, that what choice of memory technology do you use right uh, uh, all of these tie in, right? So they, they, they are all important. Effectively, you're targeting tops per watt. And the entire presentation was about tops per watt, if you, if you think about it, right? It's about how do you make the only reason you have accelerators is because they should, right? If you are, if you are doing investing effort in an accelerator over a general purpose machine, they should give you higher utilization. They should give you higher efficiency and translate it to the tops per watt. If you are not able to do that, then the whole discussion of doing an accelerator isn't there. So everything that I spoke about effectively are knobs that you turn mm. to try and reduce the, to try and increase the top spin. I just received another question by Sai Krishna from uh, NXP Austin. As the bandwidth, bandwidth requirements for this accelerator are huge, apart from using caches, uh, are there any other techniques that could be used? Uh, so sorry, uh, can you repeat the last part? Uh, are there any other techniques that could be used? What's the memory technology he mentioned? Uh, he told the, as the, the full question is, as the bandwidth requirements for this rate are huge, apart from using caches, are there any other techniques that could be used? uh so uh so again right um, when i say caches like i don't mean hardware managed caches right that's why i specifically mentioned uh memory hierarchy right uh, you you typically don't have hardware especially for continents it doesn't make sense to have hardware managed caches right you would you would effectively trash your cache right uh, just, right you, you exactly know your for loops you optimize for those for loops right and you do the whole thing in software or, or using state machines or using some firmware mechanism, right? Uh, so you, you play around with different memories, right? Like SRAMs, RFs, whatever have you, right? And you figure out how to create a hierarchy such that the reuse is effective, right? Because you might, uh, you might have a grid where you might want to bucket certain compute elements together to form a bigger compute element, right? Uh, 
there are papers that have indicated that kind of a solution right uh, and that depends again on how big your matrix multiplies for your application is right because you saw the sizes of the matrix multiplies to be such and you said you know what this is how i am going to cluster it right and this is how i am going to play around with that uh, uh, with that cluster um, memory bandwidth especially on the training side has effectively used hpms right uh, uh, but hpm comes with a huge cost penalty and you have to pay that cost penalty but it comes and that has been used effectively if you don't if you cannot feed your max um, then you have to pay that extra power penalty and use hpms other than these i am not aware of any new memory technologies that have been used Thank you. So I have a question also. So um, nowadays we can see many system on chip like uh, the Apple processors and so on with a huge set of uh, hardware simulators. So uh, what do you think about uh, the possibility to have uh, in the future a uh, system on chip based only on hardware accelerators with uh, just a small CPU to manage the communications between them. Yes. So uh, again, here, yeah, right? It's like how you draw that box, right? So you, you like if you draw the box such that the hardware accelerator is a separate piece, or do you draw that box such that the hardware accelerator is within the core, or integrated as an instruction into the core, right? All of these are strategies. In fact, even today, you have uh, CPUs with instructions for neural network that come from multiple vendors and that are being used in the industry, right? And those are also, to some extent, CPUs uh, that have a deep learning instruction extension, right? That That is there. If you look at a typical accelerator, you would see a CPU with a matrix multiply. And how you connect and draw that line? Is it is it lying within that CPU? Or are you using a processor, coprocessor model with an instruction extension? Are all micro-architectural boundary questions, right? The conversation about PCIe and uh, the core is a completely different conversation from the perspective of uh, different system level semantics. So from an edge perspective, all of these are easy, right? Or within your uh, laptop, like the Apple example, that's a much different. But when you are going for training at that scale, uh, uh, the requirements are different. The tops requirements are different. Uh, uh, and the memory capacity requirements are different. The interconnect requirements are different, right? I'm pretty sure the space will evolve and you would have even there uh, a single die-based solution. I think it's, it's a matter of time that that would happen as long as the technology permits that larger die or that sort of a solution, right? Um, uh, I'm pretty sure that would, because that gives you advantages, right? PCIe, has uh, you you don't have to go over and you are on the same die and that does give you advantage. Well, it's a peer, another question from Sai Sharan. Does AI processors evolve as a market similar to general purpose CPUs in laptops, desktops, and so on? I am talking in comparison to how Intel and others measured as general purpose CPUs. So he's a student from India. Sure. So so it's it's like uh, it's 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 how you name it. So if you look at your Intel laptop today, uh, right? Intel laptop has a neural network accelerator called as GNA, uh, Gaussian neural accelerator. It does, right? And you could potentially go and write instructions to go and use that, right? And it it is still a CPU with a like uh, if, if you look at the evolution within that soc uh, of intel you have a cpu and you have other pci devices sitting on the same soc right uh, so it depends on what you how you name it but effectively you you are right you can call it an instruction which is uh, compiler issued or you can call it an mmio issued uh, command right which is effectively what GNA has right, uh, like so, or uh, or PCIe has, right. So that is the more bound, the bigger boundary, right? It, it's more how you have the software stack communicate with this. Uh, are you having uh, a compiler instruction in the CPU itself versus you are doing MMIO calls? 
and how does that MMIO call then link with the rest of the software stack, right? Okay. So I have a final one also that is, uh, so how we can say about the uh, narrow engines that uh, we find in processors like the Apple ones, can you call it an accelerator also? Yes, uh, so uh, so within so uh, so again um, like within within so you would call it an IP, but you call it an accelerator IP, right? So if you think of an SOC and you have a, a deep learning block, now you would say, oh, that deep learning block is an accelerator IP that I integrate into the rest of the SOC, and that SOC is called as a CPU, right? Uh, so or or you say you know that CPU in itself has a new instruction microarchitecturally that does deep learning as a matrix multiply block implemented and another instruction for doing non-linearities, right? Uh, so it depends on how your micro architecture around that is and how your compiler tool chain generates it, right? But it's an interesting question. I think the answer, like I mentioned, is how software thinks about it, uh, right? And how the compiled tool chain thinks about it. Okay, so thank you very much. Krishna, it's an excellent uh, talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, you all. And uh, thank you. Bye everyone. bye. Have a nice weekend. Thank you.